Well, good evening. Good evening, my friends, and welcome to another Wednesday. Today is uh, October the 18th, and uh, this is another day uh, that God has blessed us, and we're just so happy to be able to come and share with you in these virtual Bible studies each and each week as the Lord bless us. Today is Wednesday, October the 18th, 2023. We thank God for another opportunity. I had a great day. And hopefully you did too. Uh, so we welcome you here to another virtual uh, Bible study with the New Hope Baptist Church here in Covington, Georgia. I'm your, your facilitator, Pastor Harold Miller Jr. Listen, I uh, want to remind you as we do every week uh, that if this video and these videos that we're presenting are a blessing to you they will be a blessing to someone else so we encourage you and we invite you uh, to share them on your timeline if you would like to see previous lessons uh, whether lessons on wednesday or sermons from sunday morning uh, you can find them in the video section of our uh, church facebook page the meeting by which you are perhaps uh, uh, viewing now live and they're also uh, archived on my personal YouTube page. That's a word in season, uh, YouTube page. So I want to encourage you to do that. Well, listen, as we um, start tonight, we want to remember and remind you about our Thursday night call-in prayer line. That's the New Hope Baptist Church prayer line. And that's every Thursday night. We'll be back Thursday night. We were off a couple of weeks, uh, at least one week for sure. Uh, but we'll be back tomorrow night, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And that number, uh, the call, that's from 8 p.m. until 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That number to call is 774. 2204020 again that's 774 2204020 the access code is 3721137 followed by the pound sign as we pray tonight we're remembering uh brother Lanell Thomas uh, sister Ernestine's husband I understand he's back in the hospital we're lifting him up in our prayers we also pray uh, for Sister Margaret Lackey, I'm saying she's also back in the hospital. Uh, Sister Lackey is the mother, is the daughter, oh gosh, is the sister <laughs> of our own uh, Sister Marjorie Duncan. And so uh, lives right down the street from the church in our community. So we are praying and we're lifting up in our, our prayers. We're also praying uh, for what's going on in our world. You know, there is a there's war going on in Israel between uh, Israel and Hamas. Uh, there are some situations on the northern border of Israel with Lebanon. The situation is still going on over in Ukraine. And there are various other places in the world where there is war and confusion. Even in our own country, our Congress, U.S. House of Representatives is in disarray. And so we're just praying um, that God's peace will prevail. But the Bible said that these things would be. And said that when these same came, things came to be, that we should take courage because he forewarned them. He forewarned us about them. And so this is just merely a confirmation of the scriptures. We're also praying for Sister Theodosia Thomas, Sister Vicki Baines. Uh, we're praying for uh, all of those who stand in the need of prayer. There are some families uh, that stood around the graveside, some pastors in the Atlanta area and surrounding areas who passed. We're praying for their churches as well. Uh, we're praying for our good friend and brother, uh, Pastor John H. Williams from Alabama. His mother passed. The funeral will be. Um, Tuesday, I believe, in Evergreen, Alabama. 
at the, at the church where John's pastoring at the First Baptist Church of Evergreen. And so we're lifting uh, Pastor Williams and his family up in our prayers. We're also uh, praying for the Hardman family. Uh, Sister Lula Harmon uh, made her transition funeral last few days ago. Our good friend, uh, Deacon Kenneth Hardman's sister. And so there's a lot going on. But nevertheless, in the midst of all of this, the God we serve is able and he is in control. So let's go to the Lord now in prayer, and then we'll be coming forth with our lesson for tonight. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you uh, for another privilege and another opportunity uh, to just come and share your word with these your people. We pray, God, that as your word go forth, uh, that they will be enlightened, they will be inspired, they will be informed. Uh, so that they may be able in a position uh, to better serve you and to better communicate your gospel uh, to this world. We pray, oh God, for all the situations that were mentioned. Uh, there's war in Ukraine, war in Israel. And uh, Father, we just need you. We pray for our congressmen. We pray not just for our Congress, but for all of our government officials, we just pray, oh God, that you would just give them wisdom that they may lead in a way that will bring peace and prosperity to your people. Uh, we pray, God, now for those who are sick among us. We lift up, uh, we lift up Sister Lackey. We lift up our brother Thomas, and we lift up uh, all of those who stand in the need of prayer. Sister Thomas, Theodosia Thomas, and Sister Baines, uh, uh, brother and sister Moncrief, uh, Sister Lorraine Johnson. We're still remembering uh, Sister Bonnie Wilburn, Sister Florine Wilburn. And there's so many more uh, who, who need your hand, your hand of healing. And God, we just pray that you just minister health and healing to them even now. And Father, not just them only, but all of those who stand in the need of, of healing. We pray again for those families that will stand around the graveside. Uh, there's so much going on, families who have uh, lost their loved ones through uh, death, through uh, tragic gun violence. And we pray for the people of Israel. We pray for the Palestinian people. Uh, Lord, there's just, it's just a quagmire over there. Uh, but we just pray, God, that you just have mercy. And now, Lord, give us the spirit of revelation as we seek to uh, embark to study and unravel your word. And we pray that we may hear what the spirit has to say to the church. Uh, this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, God bless you. Listen, tonight we're going to be talking about... Uh, uh, the first commandment, we want to take another look at the first commandment. Tonight, I want you to uh, have your eyes and your ears and your mind open uh, because we will probably present some ideas that maybe you have not heard before. Uh, may even seem a little bit heretical to you, uh, but uh, we hopefully you'll be able to see that uh, we're going to support our premise with scripture and that uh, in the end, God will be glorified even more than he has been in the past. And so tonight we're going to be looking at uh, another look at the first commandment. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, questions about gods questions about god another look at the first commandment questions about god notice i didn't say questions about god i said questions about gods small g o we're going to talk about that distinction tonight, and the distinction we make between capital G-O-D and small G-O-D. In fact, that is, the, that, is the, that is one of the 
primary things we want to look at uh, tonight. And hopefully we'll share some things uh, that will be enlightening to you. So again, another look at the first commandment, questions about gods. And this is the first commandment. And we're talking about the first of those 10 that were written on the tablets of the law. Uh, that Moses received from the Lord God up on the top of Mount Sinai, and he brought them down to the people. And this is the first word. And I'm reading it from several versions because I want to get you give you a clear understanding of the parameters, parameters rather, of what the word is saying. So let's look at it in the English Standard Version, which happens to be uh, one of my favorite versions. It says, you shall have no other gods before me. Same verse in the Christian Standard Bible, 2017 edition says, do not have other gods besides me. Note the ESV says before me. Christian Standard says besides me. That Hebrew word, that they are translating from uh, both uh, interpretations or both translations are correct. The Amplified Bible uh, includes them both. It says, you shall have no other gods before or besides me. Now, there, there, let me just pause and talk about shades of meaning with this word that has been translated as before. Uh, one shade of meaning could be before as in ahead of, as in priority. Uh, before can also be in front of, as in in front of me or in, 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 in my face. In fact, uh, the word, the Hebrew word, uh, really talks about his face. Pana, I believe it is, his face. You shall have no other gods in my face or before my face. Okay. The Lexham English Bible says, There shall be for you no other gods before me. That's an interesting uh, qualifications. There shall be for you no other gods before me. The New Century Version says you must not have any other gods except me. And this is the way that the text translates from the Hebrew uh, of the Masoretic text. The Masoretic text is the text that the uh, King James uses or was translated from the Old Testament, the Hebrew passage. It said it or there is not to be to you, and that's singular, other gods in my presence. It or there is not to be to you other gods in my presence. And that's, that's the literal reading of the, of the Masoretic, Masoretic text. And again, the Masoretic text is the Hebrew text from which the King James Bible is translated from. So we have no other gods before me, no other gods besides me, no other gods except me, and no other gods in my presence. All of them uh, are valid meanings. A lot of times, as you study the scripture, if you get an in-depth study, you will you will discover. Uh, the rich language of the Hebrew and the Greek allows for more than one uh, correct translation. Okay, so you need to be aware of that. Uh, when you read the Gospel of John, for instance, in the Greek and in the English, uh, John um, uh, deals with what I call Jonathan dualism. And what I mean by that, there, there are several words and concepts in John that have dual meaning. 
For instance, uh, the passage in John, uh, where I think it's John chapter one, where he says, uh, they, the, you know, in the beginning was word and words with God. And then it talks about in the, in the, in, about the darkness did not comprehend the word. Now we understand the word comprehend as to mean understand. But in the time the King James was written, the word comprehend meant to overpower or to overcome. The word in the Greek is a word that also has a dual meaning. It means to overpower, overcome, and it also means to comprehend and understand. So that happens, that's, that's particularly acute to John, but it's also happening in other places uh, in, 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 the, in the Bible. So here in this text, uh, all of these meanings are correct. You should have no other gods before me, that is in front of me, ahead of me, as far as priority is concerned. No other God in front of me, as far as in my presence or before my face. No other God besides me, that is no other God in addition to me. And uh, no other gods except me. So the, all of these are, are valid uh, meanings. Now, I think that when we look at Exodus chapter uh, 20, and I believe the, the first commandment is, uh, yes, verse 3. As we look at that, we just can't look at that verse in isolation. We also have to take in consideration what is said in verses 1 and 2. And uh, we have that uh, in uh, three uh, these versions. It says, uh, the ESV says, and God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. The Lexham English Bible puts it this way. And God spoke all these words saying, I am Yahweh your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of slaves. And as we've mentioned in, in prior lessons, if you've uh, been with us or seen some of the lessons where we mention it, uh, whenever you run across, uh, particularly in the, I think it's mostly in the Old Testament, in, our, in your English Bible, when you see the word LORD in all caps, it is, it is a reference and it is a substitution for the, the divine name of God, which is Yahweh or Yehovah. So you could say this, this Lexham English Bible translation puts it this way, and this, this is the way you know, it's translated. I am Yahweh. He does not say, I am the Lord. Uh, the translators put that term, the Lord, with Lord in all caps, because they didn't want, they did not want to use the name Yahweh at a, as a matter of respect. And the Jews are like that. We're like that in the biblical times, even today, where they don't, you know, they have so much respect for the divine name that they dare not utter it. And so this, this is where that's coming from. So again, whenever you see the word Lord, L-O-R-D, in all caps in your Old Testament, it is a substitution for the divine name Yahweh. In other words, when David, when David in Psalms 23, one, this is a passage we're all familiar with, David said, we read in our Bibles where David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. But what David literally said was, Yahweh is my shepherd. I shall not want. Okay? So because the Lord in that passage is in all caps. He said, Yahweh. He, he, uh, he, he talks about the name of God. This is a, 
the word Lord in all caps is a substitution for the divine name of God. Okay? So you need to, you need to take note of that. And that's a note of that. That's important uh, in our understanding. So Yahweh introduced himself to the Hebrews as your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Now, this, this greeting or this way of introduction provided the setting for the establishment of a covenant relationship. God always deals with his people in covenant relationship. He's trying to, to get them to understand that, 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 that the basis of what he's saying is going to establish a covenant or a bond or a contract between them. Yahweh was to be their God and they were to be Yahweh's people. Now it's interesting to note that Yahweh did not introduce himself as simply the God who brought you out of Egypt. But he says, I am Yahweh, your God. See, I am the Lord, your God. King James says, I am the Lord, thy God. This phrase, the Lord, your God, indicates a specific personal relationship between Yahweh and his people. Now, this is important because we see this, this terminology, this phrase, the Lord your God, uh, occurring hundreds of times in the Old Testament. The Lord your God, not simply the Lord God. I'm not just, he's not, he didn't say, I'm, 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 I'm Yahweh Elohim. I'm Yahweh God. No, he says, I am Yahweh, your Elohim. I am Yahweh, your God. As again, this phrase occurs hundreds of times in our Bibles, in the Old Testament. Uh, it be, in King James, it's 304 times. If you're using the English Standard Versions, you'll find it. English Standard Version, you'll find it 451 times. New King James, 452 times. The New Revised Standard, 453 times. The Lord your God. There's a reason why he does not simply say the Lord God or I am Yahweh God. He says, I am Yahweh your God. He's talking to the people of Israel. He's talking to the Hebrews. Uh, at the base of Mount Sinai. He's establishing a covenant relationship with, it, with them. And here's the point. While Yahweh is God, okay, he is a God, he's, he's Elohim, he is the supreme God. His point in that passage, and all of those passages where we see this, is he's trying to establish, or he's establishing with the, the hearer, the, the viewer, I mean, the listener, the reader, that he's personal. He has a personal covenant relationship with them. Now, this is interesting because God does not have a covenant relationship with everyone. I want to read you something here. And this is a very fundamental passage in our understanding of how God works with humanity. Uh, and I, I, I haven't heard much preaching or teaching on it. Uh, 
and is largely ignored. Uh, but I want to, I want to, uh, I want us to look at this. Uh, and this is Deuteronomy uh, 32 and 8. Deuteronomy 32 and 8. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8. Okay. Now. It says, when the most high, when the most high, that is a reference to Yahweh, divided the nations. He's talking about after what happened at the Tower of Babel. Remember the Tower of Babel, uh, because of the disobedience, God scattered them. And what happened? After God scattered them, what happened at the Tower of Babel was a rejection of God's rule and God's authority. And I'll paraphrase it because God, God simply says to them, okay, since you don't want to, to, to submit to my rule, my authority, I'm going to give you over to other gods. And I'm going to create a people for myself. And then he goes on to talk about the calling of Abraham and where the formation of the people of Israel. So there's 70 nations, okay? And of these 70 nations, they're giving over their God, Yahweh, the supreme God, gives them over to the dominion of other gods. Now listen to what this verse says. I'm going to read it here in the King James. And I'm going to make a comment. It says, when the Most High divided, the, divided to the nations their inheritance, he separated the sons of Adam. He set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Now, that's what it says in King James. That's similar to what it says. I just pulled off my shelf a copy of New American Standard Bible. It says virtually the same thing. That is what is called an anachronism. That, that's out of place. And here's why. The time is wrong. Because God could not have set the bounds of the people according to the number of Israel, according to the number of the children of Israel, when he divided the nations, because when he divided the nations, there were there was no Israel. He had not created them yet. Uh, there are some Hebrew texts and some English Bible who, who, Bibles who bring over that Hebrew text where it says he separated the sons of Adam. He set the bounds of the people according to the number of the sons of God. And I think what happened is some scribe substituted Israel for God because they didn't want to, um, uh, they were afraid that they would be taken about uh, this idea of polytheism more than one God, which is in fact true, <laughs> not the way we think. But it's true, and that's part of the point we're going to prove in this. In this, uh, one of the points we're going to argue in our discussion uh, tonight. But I brought that up uh, to share with you the point that the reason why God says to Israel, or Yahweh says to Israel, "I am the Lord your God." Excuse me, I am Yahweh your God, is because. He's trying to help them to see that there are indeed gods over other nations, but you are not to serve them. You're not to serve the gods of the other nations because I am, I am Yahweh, your God. 
I am the one who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, out of the house of slavery. I am the one who took you who were not a people and made a people out of you. That's a very important concept that is too often uh, overlooked, ignored, or perhaps not even known uh, by many uh, modern biblical readers. So let's look at some questions here. And I just touched on it a second ago. In modern theological thinking, the reality of the existence of real or actual other gods is dismissed. In other words, what I'm saying with most of modern theology, it does not accept the idea of the real existence of the actual existence of other gods beside El, uh, Yahweh or the Lord God, the God of the Bible. Now, if we do that, if we do that, uh, this commandment is reduced to an injunction against the worship of idols, man-made or imaginary gods. As I was doing some research, you know, I read uh, a commentary, a commenter, commentator who wrote, you know, that, and, and he, he, was, he was commenting on this verse. And he's saying, whatever holds the supreme place in a person's life is a God. And so when you talk to, to the Joe Blow on the street or even the average church member, when, when they read this verse where God, the Lord said, that I shall have no other gods before me, they, they take it to mean what he meant. You know, you don't put your car don't put your wife, you don't put your belongings, uh, you don't put your substance or whatever uh, before God. You don't make a God out of them. But is that what the biblical writers meant? And is that, is that what Yahweh meant? when he made this statement. I want to suggest to you that they, they were not thinking of that meaning. So, in grappling with these questions, we, want, we should note also that in the Bible, there is a distinction between gods and idols. The Bible makes a distinction between gods and idols. Two different Hebrew words. I want to suggest to you that the ancient people were not as naive and simple as we make them out to be. They knew the wood and stone objects they made, that they were their idols, that they fashioned. They knew those objects were not gods. And they did not make them to be gods. The ancient biblical people made and fashioned idols of wood and stone as the physical abodes or habitations of the spirits of the gods those idols represented. In other words, they, 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 they made an object for the purpose that the spirit of that god may manifest itself 
and inhabit that object. They knew the object was not God or not their gods. They knew that. See, the purpose of the idol was to be a physical house so that the God may manifest himself or itself in that idol. Now, here's an interesting thing. Yahweh forbade the Hebrews from making idols and graven images. That's the next commandment. We expounds on it. You shall not make a graven image of anything from heaven above, on earth beneath the earth, in the sea, or whatever. He forbade, he forbade them from even making an image to represent himself. And he did that because of the reasons stated above, because, because this, that's what the heathens were doing. That's what the other nations were doing. But more importantly, I think the point he was trying to get them to see, and that many of us failed to see, is that God's spirit was not designed, he's not designed to manifest himself in objects of wood and stone, but he 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 wants to manifest himself through us. Interesting parallel because are we not supposedly those of us who are saved? Paul says that the Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, is in us. We are the house of God's Spirit. So, in a sense, we are the redeemed, we are the idols of God. Because God's spirit is manifested in our flesh. Whatever God does in the earth, see, he's going to do it through a human. That human is going to be inspired in spirit. <laughs> see, that's what the word inspired literally means, in spirit enthused god in god within see all these words we use on a daily basis have theological meaning we don't even know about it but god wants to 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 manifest himself through human flesh of course the ultimate manifestation was through jesus and so i suggest that, that God forbade at that time his people from making idols because God wanted them to understand that they were his idols, that he intended or he wanted to manifest himself, not through wood and stone as the healing gods, but through human flesh. Now, I ran across an interesting commentary on this verse, and this is from John Durham. You can find this in uh, the Word Biblical Commentary, Exodus Volume 3 on page 285, and this is directly uh, from that uh, uh, book. He says, as the survey of other forms of this prohibition makes clear, and I have it in red because this is what I want to emphasize. The first commandment is not an assertion of monotheistic conviction that Yahweh is the only God. Hence the sole choice. The OT, the Old Testament, makes very clear that such it was not the case in the world of ancient Israel. 
what he's saying is that this text is not saying that Yahweh is the only God that exists. It's not saying what we have traditionally made it to say. We have traditionally made it to say, and we have traditionally uh, learned, taught, preached, and proclaimed that there is only one God that exists and that all other uh, mentions of gods are merely idols or figurements of men's imagination. However, that is not how the ancient biblical writers perceive God. He said the first commandment, in a sense, was called for by the many gods who demanded of Israel the allegiance Yahweh alone had the right to command. The commandment does not specify that no other that no one is to have other gods, but that Israel is to have no other gods. See, I was talking about that earlier because he wanted to establish a unique covenant relationship with his people. This was not a universal commandment for the whole world. This was specific, really, to the, to the Hebrew people, because at that time he was forming a nation. It was specific to those who would declare their allegiance to Yahweh. Okay? So it is connected to Yahweh's jealousy. He says, I'm a jealous God. Why? Because he and his people are in a covenant relationship, like a marriage. Okay? And so this comes from John Durham, Word Biblical Commentary. And I want to read that and read it again. So the first commandment is not an assertion, because I, I want I to emphasize this. I put this in here. Because I want you to understand, I'm not the I'm not the only person advocating this. Uh, this is the viewpoint of most scholars, biblical scholars. Uh, but we just haven't uh, read the text from a theological perspective. We read that we've always we have a habit of reading the biblical text from a traditional and folklore perspective. He said the first commandment was not an assertion of monotheistic conviction that Yahweh is the only God and hence the sole choice. The Old Testament makes very clear that such was not the case in the world of ancient Israel. We're going to look at some more passages, some more verses that's going to illustrate that that was not the case. This idea of monotheism that we that we so strongly proclaim is really a projection of us back onto them. And I'm going to show you how that how that works as we go on. Now, at this point, you may be asking the question, well, what about? And I have some passages here in Isaiah where where it seems that if you read them on the surface that they declare that there is only one God. Isaiah 44 and 6 is King James. Well, all of them are King James. It says, thus says the Lord Yahweh, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, Yahweh of hosts. There it is, the Lord, the Lord in all caps. Think Yahweh. Whenever you see the Lord in all caps, the divine name, Yahweh. I am the first and I am the last. And beside me, there is no God. Isaiah 44 and 8. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have I not told thee from that time and have declared it? 
ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Isaiah 45, verses 5 and 6. I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. And there is none else. There is no God beside me. Note the, note the language. No God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. And there is none else. Okay. So it seems to be saying what we have traditionally held all the time that the Lord God, the God of Israel, is the only God. It says right there in black and white beside me, there is no God. Okay. But I want to suggest to you that we misunderstood those statements because I'm going to read you another statement and notice that all those passages we just read found in Isaiah, I'm going to read you another passage in Isaiah that uses similar language. This is from Isaiah chapter 47 verses 5 through 10. I'm taking this from the English Standard Version. It says, sit in silence and go in darkness, O daughters of the Chaldeans. Talking about Babylon. Daughters of the Chaldeans, another name for the Babylonians. For ye shall no more be called the mistress of kingdoms. I was angry with my people. I profaned my heritage. I gave them into your hand. This is God. This is Yahweh talking about the Babylonian captivity. He says, you show them no mercy. On the age, you made your yoke exceedingly heavy. You said, I shall be mistress forever. So that you did not lay these things to heart or remember their end. Now, therefore, hear this, you lover of pleasures, who sit securely, who say in your heart, I am, and there is none, and there is no one besides me. I shall not sit as a widow or know the loss of children. These two things shall come to you in a moment, in one day. The loss of children and widowhood Shall, shall come upon you in full measure in spite of your many sorceries and the great power of your enchantments. You felt secure in your wickedness. You said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge led you astray. And you said in your heart, I am, and there is no one besides me. So we have here, we have Babylon using the same language to describe herself as God in the previous verses, as Yahweh in the previous verses used to describe himself. Let's look at Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 13 and 15. And this is Nineveh. We have these two cities. We have Nineveh. We have Babylon in the Isaiah passage. In this passage in Zephaniah is Nineveh. He said, passage says, and he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria and will make Nineveh a desolation and dry like a wilderness. And the flocks shall lie down in the midst of her, all the beasts of the nation, nations, both the cormorant and the bittering shall lodge in the upper lintels of it. Their voice shall sing in the windows. It's some, some type of birds. 
desolation shall be in the thresholds, for he shall uncover the cedar work. This is rejoicing, is this is the rejoicing city that dwelt carelessly, that said in her heart, I am, and there is none besides me. How is she made become a desolation, a place for beasts to lie down in? Everyone that passes by her shall hiss and wag his hand. Note the language used by both Babylon and Nineveh. Same language that's used by the Lord God, Yahweh. There is none besides me. There's none beside me. So when we read this on the surface, you would think just by reading those passages in Isaiah 47, 5 through 10 and Zephaniah 2, 13 and 15, one might be led to believe or, or lead one, it might lead one to think that Babylon and Nineveh thought they were the only cities in the world in their day. After all, after all, both cities boasted there is none besides me. Of course, that's ridiculous. There were many more cities in the world in that day and time. And these cities were not declaring that no other cities existed. But rather, with that statement, there is none besides me, they were saying no other cities could be compared to them. No other cities were like them in their greatness. So in the same way, the none besides me statements of Yahweh are not, were not and are not statements of exclusiveness, but rather statements of incomparability. In other words, in these statements, Yahweh declares that there is no other God that can be compared to him. Yahweh is supreme, the most high God. So we need to understand that when God says, there is no other God beside me, he's not saying that he's the only one. He's saying there's no other God that can be compared to him. He's beyond and above all others. Just as Babylon and Nineveh boasted that there was none beside them. Same language. In fact, it's found in the same uh, book, Isaiah. And so that gives the indication, same language. It's not a, not a statement of exclusiveness, but rather a statement of incomparability. Let's look at some other hints. Remember, we talked about this phrase few, few, back a few frames earlier, the most high God. The most high God or the most high occurs almost 50 times, 49 times in the King James, 47 times in the ESV. If you look at the dictionary, the, the term most means greatest in quantity, extent, or degree. And notice I have this, this picture over here, this mountain, this mountain range, this, 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 this uh, peak here is the most high peak. By looking at the picture, how do I know it's the most high? It is the most high peak because I am comparing its height with the peaks of the other mountain ranges. And it is the most high peak. Okay. So think about it. Think about it for a minute. 
the phrase, the most high God, is meaningless. It means nothing if there are no less high gods. Because if there are no less high gods, then he's not the most high God, because that statement would make absolutely no sense. It is a statement of comparison. The most high God. It means Yahweh is the greatest. Now, if there are no gods, as we as, as most modern theology uh, seems to attest, traditional theology seems to attest, if there is no, if Yahweh, if there are no other gods, if there are no lesser gods, I'm talking about real gods, I'm not talking about idols, because that's even worse. Because if you have Yahweh comparing himself to an idol, that's worse. Because idols were nothing. And if we say that there are no other gods and that these gods are just merely idols or figments of our imagination, then when you use the term the most high God, you're saying that Yahweh or the God of the Bible is the highest of nothing. And that makes absolute, absolutely, that's a statement of, of, of absurdity. It is a senseless statement because you and I are greater than nothing. So let's look at some other biblical evidence of other gods. Passages are all over throughout the Bible, but we read them and we just keep on reading. Don't, don't think about the implications of them. In Hebrew, in Exodus, rather, Chapter 12, verse 12, God makes the assertion. He says, I will pass through the land of Egypt. This, this is during the Egyptian uh, emancipation deal. He says, I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and strike every firstborn male in the land of Egypt, both people and animals. I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. I will execute judgments against all the gods of Egypt. By the way, every one of those plagues was a, a, an assault against a god of Egypt. It wasn't just about Pharaoh. It wasn't just about putting pressure on Pharaoh. Every one of those plagues was an assault against a Pacific God of Egypt. Exodus 15, 11, Moses write, who is like unto thee, O Lord, who is like unto thee, O Yahweh, among the gods, who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praise, doing wonders. And again, if there are really no other gods, if there are no gods, who is like thee, O Lord, among the nothings? You see how ridiculous that statement sounds? See, we don't think our theology through. Now, here's, here's one that, that, that you know, people have debated. Uh, Psalms 82. They make them out to be the divine council, Jewish men, referring to Jewish, the Jewish leaders. Uh, but since when has God descended or when has the Jewish humans ascended to be part of God's divine council? We see the divine council in Job chapter one where it says, and the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And the text literally says, the Satan, not Satan. In that passage, that Satan is not a name. Satan is a title. It is an office in God's divine counsel. It's not the Satan in Job chapter one and Job chapter two is not the Satan of the New Testament that Jesus deals with in the 
in the in the in the wilderness temptation. That's another lesson. I've covered it before. God has taken his place in the divine council, in the midst of the gods, in the midst of the Elohim, is what it really says, literally in the Hebrew. Yahweh, Elohim, or in that, in that passage, it says Elohim has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the Elohim, he holds judgment. Now, but in the, the term, the Hebrew term Elohim is, is a plural term. But from the context, we see that the first Elohim has to be singular because, and the second Elohim has to be plural because you cannot be in the midst of one. See? You have to, and you cannot be in the midst of yourself. You read the text, you read all of, uh, of Psalms 82, it's obvious he is talking to lesser gods. Psalms 86 and 8 says, There is none like you among the gods. Again, if, if we assert that the gods are merely idols and figments of our imagination, then we're saying there's none like you among the, imagine, the imaginary gods. There's none like you among Santa Claus. There's none like you among the, the two fairies. That's just how ridiculous that we make that statement. If we hold to the assertion that the other gods or the lesser gods are not real. There's none like you among the gods, O Lord, O Yahweh, nor are there any works like yours. So again, remember, the biblical writers distinguish between gods and idols. Therefore, if Yahweh considered the gods of Egypt as idols, he would have said that he executed judgment against all the idols of Egypt. And really, that wouldn't have been no big deal. If the gods were mere idols or imaginary, then Exodus 15, 11 and Psalms 86 and 8 are ridiculous and absurd statements. We just illustrated that. Because a human or even an animal is greater than beings that do not exist. I am greater than the tooth fairy. <laughs> because the tooth fairy is a, is a figment of our imagination. See? Psalms 82 reflects the relationship between Yahweh and the gods. Yahweh is the supreme God to which all other gods are ultimately accountable. We see that in Psalms 82 because it's a council meeting where God is sitting in judgment of the other gods or the lesser gods. Now, a lot of this occurs because of what I call, what is called the modern misunderstanding of the term God. G O D, because modern biblical re Bible readers and people in general, when they hear, read, understand, and they understand the term God as a blanket reference to the supreme God. However, this was not how the biblical under biblical writers understood or used the term. The Hebrew term for God is. Elohim. So everywhere you see the term God in English is, is, is Elohim. In the Bible, the term Elohim is used to signify Yahweh, the God of Israel, thousands of times. It's used to signify members of Yahweh's council, also known as the sons of God. 
sons of Elohim. Okay. Let's look at Deuteronomy 4.35 as an example so we can give us some context. And we'll be through in just a second. I'm not, I'm not going to press this too much, too much longer. Okay. And that verse says to you, it was shown that you might know that Yahweh, he is Elohim, and there is no other besides him. Again, a statement of incomparability. It's also used as to, uh, to, to describe the gods and goddesses of other nations, demons, Shadim. And by the way, the demons of the Old Testament are not the, were not the evil, necessarily the evil beings of the New Testament. Also used to describe the human deceased. It was used of Samuel. Samuel is described as an Elohim in 1 Samuel 28 and 13. And angels or, and the, or the angel of Yahweh. He is described as an Elohim in Genesis chapter 35, verse 7. The point being that the term Elohim in the Hebrew Bible is not restricted to Yahweh. And depending on the context, the term can be translated. It's a plural term when you look at it. And, and analyze it is plural, but it also can be used as plural or singular, depending on the context. Now, here's the point. The term Elohim refers to a class of being, not one specific being. In other words, technically speaking, in the Hebrew Bible, Elohim refers to a class of being, not a specific being. Elohim is like the term human. I am a human. You are a human. The term human refers to a general class, not a specific individual human. So really the term God term Elohim, we translate as God, is God is not who he is. God is what he is. Let me say it again. Technically speaking, in the Bible, the term God does not refer to who he is. It refers to what he is. He is an Elohim. Dr. Michael Heiser, in his work, uh, The Unseen Realm, Recovering the Supernatural Worldview of the Bible, uh, makes this statement in reference to what we're talking about. He says, the biblical use of Elohim is not hard to understand once we know that it isn't about attributes. It isn't about, when we talk about Elohim, we use the term, it, it, it's not talking about a specific individual that's all seeing and all knowing and all, you know, all omnipresence. It's not talking about that. All, what all the figures on the list, and the, and the list was the one we just talked about, they have, what they have in common is that they are inhabitants of the spiritual world. And in that realm, there is, an, there is hierarchy. For example, Yahweh possess, possesses spiritual attributes, superior attributes, with respect to all Elohim. But God's attributes aren't what makes him an Elohim, since inferior beings are members of that same group. In other words, 
God's attributes, his omnipresence, his omniscience is not what make him God. Specifically the term, not what makes him an Elohim. See, the Old Testament writers understood that Yahweh was an Elohim, but no other Elohim was Yahweh. He was species unique among all the residents of the spiritual world. Okay? So when we use the term God, what he's saying is that it is not a reference to his, to his attributes. Now we make it a reference to his attributes, and that's why we get confused. That's why we that's why we're backed into the into the theological corner to declare there are no other gods, because we have we have used the term God to specifically denote one Elohim or one God without understanding that Elohim has nothing to do with attributes, but rather to do with class of being, beings in the spiritual realm. So now this is not polytheism. Because one might think that might be tempted to think that this is that this author me is suggesting the idea of polytheism. Because the definition of polytheism is the belief in or the worship of more than one God. Israel was unique in that day and time, not because. Israel was saying or said there was only one God. Israel was unique because they only worshipped, they only believed in, they only trusted in, they only relied upon one God. You see, the problem is we have traditionally misunderstood what polytheism and monotheism actually means. Now, one might ask at this point, if there are other gods, where they come from? How did they come into existence? Are these gods competing with Yahweh? No, not originally. Just as human beings were created by Yahweh to represent and share his administration in the physical world, Yahweh also created spiritual beings, gods, to represent and share his administration in the spiritual realm. And just as humans were created with free will, with the ability to potentially rebel, so were these gods, these lesser gods created with free will, which at some point, some of them used to rebel and became uh, antith antithetical to Yahweh. Now we have to, we have to acknowledge this because Yahweh is unique. And that Yahweh is the only perfect and infallible being. All other beings, divine or human, are imperfect and fallible and therefore have the potential to sin. Because you have to understand when we talk about the gods, we're not saying they're sinless, there's only one perfect being. Yahweh. That is what makes him unique. Not the fact that he's 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 an Elohim. But the fact that he is the supreme Elohim. 
that created all other Elohim and all other human beings and all human beings. I hope you see that distinction and I hope I did not confuse you. So let's conclude. From the evidence presented in this study, we can conclude the first commandment was not about the denial of the existence of other gods, but rather it was about the forbidding of the worship of those gods, which would usurp Yahweh's rightful place as the God of Israel, the only Elohim, the only Elohim, the only God worthy of worship. I hope this study was a blessing to you. Listen, it was, I know it's kind of heavy theologically, theologically heavy, so you might have to go back over it. Please do. Do research on your own. I stand open to critique. I do not uh, suggest or even want to imply that I know it all and that I am absolutely right. But what I have done and what I do do is I use and I try to use and understand scripture within the biblical context, not our context, but within biblical context to make the assertions that I make. Well, God bless you, my brothers and sisters. That's it for tonight. Listen, I pray and hope now, as I always say, if this a uh, lesson has been a benefit or a blessing to you. It'll be a benefit and blessings to someone else. So share it on your timeline. Till the next time, may the Lord bless you real good is our prayer.